Thanks for joining us today for virtual access. Today, we're looking at a new focus on safety in downtown Seattle. The city is bouncing back from the depths of the pandemic. Uh, many of the indicators are good in terms of foot traffic and transportation, but concerns about safety and security, particularly in the retail core, do remain. The heart of downtown, including Third Avenue, is impacted by drug dealing and drug use, organized retail crime, chronic homelessness, and untreated mental illness. And the roots of many of these issues are complex and longstanding. Now, recognizing the need, but seeing the opportunity for a measurable, sustained, and highly coordinated approach, Seattle Police and local social service agencies have joined forces to implement what they're describing as a focused response in downtown Seattle. And three of the people most closely involved in this new effort comprise our panel this morning. Lisa Dugard is Executive Director of the Public Defender Association and has been since 2015. In 2011, she helped create the Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion, or LEAD, program which is an innovative collaboration between public defenders, police, and prosecutors. During the height of the pandemic, she helped create Just Care, a coalition of the Public Defender Association, Reach, and We Deliver Care. And the organization was launched in 2020 using one-time Federal CARES Act money to offer alternatives to get those living unsheltered to more stable indoor environments. Dominique Davis, founder and CEO of Community Passageways, a Seattle-based nonprofit launched in 2017 with a vision for zero youth incarceration. As a felony diversion and prevention program, Community Passageways is leading the way in reimagining and actively creating an alternative to today's criminal legal system. He served as co-director of the 180 program, which was named the 2015 Best New Nonprofit by the Seattle Foundation and Seattle Met Magazine. Dominique is also a member of the DSA Board of Directors. And finally, Captain Steve Strand is with the West Precinct of the Seattle Police Department. Captain Strand began his career with SPD in 1991. He's held various positions with the department, working on complex investigations, undercover assignments with vice and in the criminal intelligence section. As a sergeant and lieutenant, he spent his time between the South and Southwest precincts. He was promoted to captain in 2020 and assigned to the West Precinct this past December. Now, uh, we do have some questions prepared in advance and we'll get to audience questions throughout along the way. And uh, to facilitate that, as Emily mentioned, I want to encourage everyone to use the chat function to post questions anytime during the conversation. We do monitor those, and they really help move the conversation along. Now, usually before we begin the conversation, we look at some data points, um, and uh, we have some this morning that have been provided to us uh, via Captain Strand at the Seattle Police Department. Now, anecdotally, in the past few months, things do feel better in downtown Seattle. They feel better along 3rd Avenue and Pike and Pine in the area that we're talking about this morning. Now, Captain Strand, these, uh, this data that you provided, does the data back up that anecdotal feeling that things are getting better? And can you kind of help tease out some of the details? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, so on this first slide, what this shows is the uh, shaded area is all of Mary sector. And then we looked into our emphasis area drilling down. And this was when we started back in March of this year uh, at the Third and Pine kind of uh, intersection there. And this was because of the level of violence we were seeing in that neighborhood. Um, and so when you look at these numbers, what, what's hard to tell is the, uh, the violence was low um, comparatively to the other calls. But if you look closely, you'll see that they've gone about down, um, you know, in double digits. Uh, so pre uh, to post emphasis sector, if you look at that top little slide, you see it went from 156 violent crimes down to 114. This is judging the first four months before the uh, emphasis to the next four months after the emphasis started. Same thing, property crimes, uh, those reduced substantially. Our calls for service uh, were down noticeably. And then our officer on view or our proactive police enforcement um, really shot up. If you go to the next slide, uh, this again, it shows the uh, trends. So it shows before the emphasis, the four months prior and how we were going steadily upwards. And then as soon as the emphasis started, and when I talk about the emphasis, it was a visible presence, but also a focused enforcement on uh, the drug trafficking and the stolen merchandise um, kind of black market that was happening. And so you can see again, the trend lines going down uh, pretty substantial after our emphasis started. 
And this is uh, some of the same. This is uh, including our violent and property crimes before the emphasis and then after the emphasis. Uh, again, showing that uh, it kind of peaked in that December, January timeframe, uh, but was still on an upward trend. And then after our March emphasis, we've been steadily coming down. Uh, this one to me is, is very significant because for me, it's all about uh, saving lives. And so if you look at the homicides, we had two of them in that four month period before the emphasis started. And in the four months after that, we had zero. Um, and so that was uh, really, um, you know, our goal in this is really to save people's lives and make a difference. And then if you just look at the percent change, you can see how uh, it's gone down, you know, 100%. 67 percent, 51 percent throughout the property crimes and violent crimes uh, really was a su substantial difference. And this talks about the overall call volumes and what um, we have done is because we have our officers out there working extra, some of this you'll see go up because they're out there doing proactive police work. Um, and so some of those numbers will be a little bit misleading when you compare them. But if you go to the next slide, I think it is, or is that the last one? That's the last one. Coming. That's the last one. So, I mean, it seems that a lot of the success that's happening there is because you're applying consistent levels of resources over a focus area. Um, SPD, like everybody, is stretched thin with resources and the ability to do this kind of thing. How do you how do you provide this kind of focus, this consistent focus, this consistent level, given all the challenges that SPD is facing? Yeah, we definitely have a, a resource uh, crisis on our hands right now within our police department. But I want to thank all of our partners that have been working in the area with us um, for the uh, all the outreach that is being done, the service providers, um, and are working with LEAD to create this diversion and outreach. Um, the DSA and MID, I think, have been terrific in their ambassadors, uh, the cleanup crews, and then their security officers that are out in the area, really making it safe for their people to do that work. And I think that creates that feeling of safety uh, that goes a long way. And then uh, the city attorney also uh, began a high utilizer initiative. I think that was really um, part of the solution was focusing on the ones that were creating uh, the biggest demand for resources. Okay. And that's part of what we're going to talk about today with this new effort, um, that this new focused effort, it's a partnership between a couple of different groups. Um, and Lisa Dugard, why don't you set the stage? What is it that this new effort's called and give me the focus area, what, what the, what the goals are. Sure. Good morning. Um, thanks for having us. So the new, um, effort is called very creatively, the Third Avenue Project. And um, the proposed focus area is between Stewart and University um, on Third Avenue, and then stretching one block to the east and one block to the west, um, up to Second and Fourth Avenues. And then there's a second sector from University down to Cherry that will sort of have a different um, composition of uh, backbone service providers. So the the idea is to recognize that the public safety, public order issues in this area are longstanding, you know, going back to when most of us were kids, actually. Um, this is a really persistent area um, for illicit activity for decades. So it's a um, deeply entrenched pattern of behavior, but it's also complicated. We know that uh, a lot of folks out in the area engaged in illegal activity are selling to make income, selling either stolen property or drugs to, you know, for, for income. And there are a lot of folks in this zone who have um, serious mental illness and a lot of people in this zone who are unsheltered, not downtown, but come to this area either to buy drugs or for other reasons and maybe even to get uh, services. And then there are some people who are unsheltered in the immediate area. So there are um, layers of different issues that are that all present in the same um, limited geography. And no one answer right is the right answer for all of those dynamics. 
what we rarely do, and which means that no one program, right, of all the um, standalone efforts that people have heard of, including LEAD, for example, you know, this is not the right match for everybody um, who's out there. Yet, um, we do need to mobilize an answer and to um, complement what SPD is doing. And I do want to really um, acknowledge and commend the impact of, of SPD's emphasis. I think there's no question that that um, has made an impact and a difference. But for the circumstances of the, the individuals who have been in this area and the focus of concern, is that emphasis chaining, you know, changing what's going on with them long term, or are there issues going to just be popping up somewhere else? We want to tackle what's going on underlying people's presence in this area and try to change um, outcomes with all of these individuals long term. So there's a coalition of um, service providers that has come together to work together for a year and see what we can do um, in this area. Um, our office PDA will project manage the effort, but the backbone um, presence from Stewart to university will be provided by um, Dawn's uh, organization, We Deliver Care. And then um, the other service providers who will be coming as needed to work with the population that they, spe that they specialize in include um, Seattle's uh, HOPE team working with HSD, Health One, um, the Downtown Emergency Service Center's Behavioral Health Response Team, um, the Mobile Crisis Team responding through Crisis Connections, LEAD, um, which is staffed by the REACH program, um, and uh, there will be some connection with the King County Regional Homelessness Authority and their Partnership for Zero um, system uh, advocates who are working to find permanent housing for people who are living unsheltered downtown. So, that coalition will be working with a data sharing, information sharing platform to coordinate care so that we're not stepping all over each other, but actually handing the baton off to one another. And of course, coordinating with um, SPD. And I forgot to mention critical partners, the MID um, and uh, the clean team and the MID ambassadors. That's a lot of partners, <laughs> a lot of uh, acronyms and uh, portmanteaus and things. Is it? Um... It's hard, it's probably hard to keep track for some people watching today and, and listening to this program today. Um, but it seems like the key part is there's public sector with SPD and then a lot of nonprofits that get public funding to tackle different areas that impact this this issue in terms of the the things that people are suffering in that area and the reasons people are, are creating problems in the area that we're talking about. Um, Felix, I do want to just make clear that um, none of those nonprofits are receiving any funds to do this no. work. Um, everyone is is sort of reaching in to help within current budget. So that the okay. new funding is just to establish this new team at We Deliver Care. But but it is a it's a but in terms of just general ecology, it's an assortment of public sector and private sector public agencies and privately funded nonprofits, publicly funded nonprofits, that sort of thing. Um, so you know, I think. People lost listening today, watching today, probably have heard the words, you know, we're coalition and it's new effort. And it's a new team. It's a new focus, a new emphasis. Um, we've heard that multiple times over the years with different projects that have come and gone that have had some good results and some that have just sort of fizzled out. What makes this one different? And maybe is this, this maybe this is a question for Dom. What makes this effort different from previous efforts? Um, I really think of the collaboration and the, um, focus in one um, area. I mean, I've never seen that done before, this, this big of a collaboration with law enforcement and um, nonprofits and uh, um, other uh, organizations coming together. Like this, this unified front is what makes it different, right? All working together for one um, um, vision and, and one purpose to, to make an area safer, to let the businesses thrive, open back up like we I don't know um this has been a problem for a very long time in our city like Lisa was saying but um over all the years that I've been here my entire life and I've watched downtown on this roller coaster of, of being labeled as this dangerous place and seeing um all these moving parts um from um from the 80s all the way through 
I've never seen everybody come together like this. I've never seen everybody come and say, hey, look, this is the area we're gonna focus on. This is the mission we're all gonna work on together. We're all gonna collaborate. We're all gonna move in a un unison together and we're all gonna uh, make sure that we get to this point, right? We have a point that we wanna get to. Never seen that, that's different. And then also the difference is an organization like mine coming in being asked to come in, being asked to step into this space, being asked to do this work from a community perspective and with a community approach, with a relational approach, with a de-escalation approach. Like all the things that we're coming in is all about community and having a heart for the community. So usually back in the, in the past, it was, we need law enforcement to straighten this out. And law enforcement has been very effective um, with the, what they've been doing. I, um, they've done a great job. I mean, you just seen the data and the stats. But um, even with just law enforcement, we know that this roller coaster could go back up again and come back down again. And so we want to um, show that community law enforcement can all come together and work together for one common cause and purpose and um, be aligned in what we want to do together. So I think the difference is that approach, the community approach with law enforcement and other agencies being focused. And so how will the coordination work? Because it sounds like this has the potential to be pretty complex and things to kind of go awry if there isn't really clear communication and coordination. How is that aspect of this being handled? It's very complicated, honestly. <laughs> I'm just going to be very transparent up front. And the only way that we're going to be able to um, make this work through all the complication is to be in constant communication with each other and to be able to align our work with each other, make sure we all know what our roles are and our lanes are, and make sure that we're all going in the same direction together, but in our lanes, right? And Being able to leverage and use each other in whatever way we need to, um, and making sure that we uh, tap into our talents and, and our special our specialties. Like there's a, a lane for each organization, and each organization has their specialty. And as long as we stay in that structure and understand what our roles are, and we all know how to collaborate with each other and also how to use and leverage each other, we'll be okay. And, and sp speaking specifically, if we deliver care, I mean, this, this is a pretty radic radically different approach that you're bringing to this project. What is, it, what is the lane that your group will be in, in in terms of how it coordinates with this project? Well, actually, just having a, a, a community presence out there, um, being able to uh, relate, communicate and um, understand the demographic of people that we're serving and that we're working with, that's the specialty that we come. Literally, we are using people that have been down the same streets and in the same <laughs> situations and empowering them and training them to go back into those situations with a changed mindset and a new um, outlook on, on who they are so they can go in and relate to the people that they're addressing and helping and communicate with them at the level that they need to, to get them the um, services and resources that they need. So, I mean, our lane is just to go in and, and, and commune. Let's just commune, community, commune, relation, you know, just connect and, and just be there and be in that space consistently and have a consistent presence daily, seven days a week where we're just constantly there for the help and aid. Because when people are in the positions that they're in, um, in, in, in these situations or the, uh, that they're in, um, sometimes they don't want help. And then there's days that they do want help. And we want to be there consistently to catch them on those days that they want to say, hey, I'm ready, right? When they weren't ready the day before. And Captain Strand, I mean, is this the SPD still like the front line for this? Is, are you, what's the role that SPD is playing specifically in, in this Third Avenue project? Yeah, I wouldn't say that we are the front line. I think this is really a team effort. And there are a lot of uh, city departments that are engaged in making this better. Um, we first looked at the area with a uh, crime prevention through environmental design kind of lens to look at the lighting and the bus stops and what we could move around and increase the guardianship and some of the other things that make areas safer. Um, and then it's uh, I think what uh, Dom and Lisa do is really reach out to the individuals in the area, whereas we look at in an area that we want to improve and they really get down into the weeds with the individual people that are um, involved in the activities out there that 
try to get them into a better place. So I think it's really all of us working together in our own pieces uh, and coming at this thing from many perspectives that makes a difference. And one of the things I hope that is different this time is that this is not some emphasis that has a time frame that it doesn't expire, that this is something that we have committed ourselves to, to make this area um, better in the long run so that, you know, five years from now and 10 years from now, we can still see that um, we have made improvements and things are going in the right direction. And, and Lisa, in terms of the specifics, um, like, can you sort of paint a picture of what this, what this project looks like in action, like on the sidewalk or on the street? Like what's, what would, what's actually going on? Who's involved? How does it play out in a, in a typical, if there is such a thing as a typical day or a typical contact with somebody? Sure. Let me just be clear. We haven't we haven't launched this yet. So um, early December will be the the go live, the planned go live um, period, and we'll just have to um, you know learn what the day where the typical day looks like as we go. But this is what's planned. So and I I've been answering some questions in the chat about this. Um, so we there are a bunch of partners and we have really, um, <clears throat> we know from LEAD and from Just Care, which is a, was a multi-partner effort that was super impactful, super, I think everybody knows that it, you know, it always did what it set out to do, it, um, delivered sooner than projected and um, with a lot of positive neighborhood impact. So we know the project, man the strength of the project management that it takes to deliver that and we will make sure that that is available for the Third Avenue project. We, um, in that project management role, <clears throat> we've acquired a, an information sharing platform that's gonna allow all of the partners to input in real time what they're seeing, who they are referring to whom, who is responding, and essentially who's got the ball so that we're not you know, um, having multiple efforts that are unintentionally cutting against one another, um, and if there is a gap and we don't have the right uh, entity to respond, we can quickly see that. Um, so every morning, this is seven days a week, um, every morning, the first um, folks on the scene really are the mid team and they are gonna have access to input what they're seeing about individuals and locations directly into this information sharing platform. Um, the We Deliver Care team will have a constant presence from that when we're when fully staffed from mid morning until the close of um, evening business hours, and um, we're still figuring out exactly where to put the first team while WDC is still staffing up. But um, they will have a constant presence. There are individuals; they are the the direct service provider for those. Are, those are people engaged in illicit commercial activity, and um, they will be engaging around you know, people's long-term plans for their lives and um, interest in making a living in another way so that we're not just displacing activity, we're actually working at what's going on with each person. But the folks who have higher acuity mental illness, who are unsheltered, who are using drugs, um, those are referrals to the specialty teams or people who are in medical or behavioral health crisis. So those referrals um, will be made directly to the partner organizations by WDC or any of the other partners who happen to be out. And that follow-up will be documented in the information sharing platform. Um, obviously, we're going to be keeping records on number of responses, and we will have a by name list for the entire project. And some of the organizations are um, integrating their existing case management systems with this shared platform so that we're just importing their by name list of people we already know are on Third Avenue. Hope that gives some flavor. You know, people will be responding to their um, to to individuals who are um, their folks who um, their special services are the right match for, as needed on call, stretching into evening hours. As I mentioned, nobody's getting other than WDC standing up this backbone um, uh, team. Nobody's getting new staff or personnel, so we're going to do the best we can with what we have, but there's no question that this level of coordination and on-call response is going to be a new, we've not done this before. And a problem as complicated as what is going on in the downtown core can't be responded to by a single initiative. So for the first time, we're going to put all of the initiatives together and 
hopefully have 360 degree response. Are you in coordination? I mean, coordination with like other sort of efforts related to unhoused, like the King County Regional Homeless Authority. How do the, some of those other existing entities fit into this if they're not directly involved as partners? Yeah, well, as I mentioned, King County Regional Homelessness Authority is relating to this project. They're still um, staffing up their uh, system advocate team that's doing the work of Partnership for Zero. Um, they have the option of integration with this, um, of data integration with this information sharing platform if they want to exercise that. They're maintaining a by-name list of people who are living unsheltered downtown. If we encounter those people in the Third Avenue zone, we will be able to let their um, system advocates know in real time. And if they need to come out, let's say they have a person who um, they are looking for because they have the opportunity to sign a lease. We encounter them on Third Avenue. We'll be able to let them know right away so that their team can come and find their folks. Um, the HOPE team will be in direct dialogue with uh, KCRHA, the Regional Homelessness Authority, about whether the um, folks that we're finding on Third Avenue are on that Partnership for Zero by name list or should be. So yes, they'll absolutely be, whether or not they will maintain a constant presence on uh, the street as part of this team, they're not staffed to do that at this juncture, but um, their individual case management that they're doing for folks living unsheltered downtown will be coordinated with this can, effort. For someone who might not know the some of the background on some of these groups that are involved, can you just give me a quick thumbnail sketch of what the HOPE team is and what the by name list is? Sure. By name yeah. list is a practice um, that's now several decades old for making sure that um, people in need whose needs are being managed or addressed, um, that that information is is kept and built on so that you're not, you know, every day isn't just a brand new encounter where you're starting from zero. Um, so that what is known about a person's situation is cumulatively increased and um, the concept of by name list is being used by the King County Regional Homelessness Authority. Um, we're using it, uh, and many of the partners here already have their own. You know, the lead participant list is a by name list, if you will, and, and we store those data and are continuously adding to them. So, what um, when I refer to that for the Third Avenue project, we have multiple partners who know a lot about many of the people who are out there. It's really important that we bring all of that existing knowledge to bear so that when we have a, an encounter on any given day, we aren't asking stupid questions that alienate people. We already know what just went on with them last week, the um, compassionate connection can be made. And also we don't inadvertently uh, mess something up. If the you know, behavioral health response team that does case management for people with severe mental illness is planning to come out and find somebody um, and take them to, um, you know, try to um, get mental health treatment. You don't want some other team member to have taken them off for lunch at International House of Pancakes or something at that same time. So um, the by name list approach allows that, um, that care coordination. The team members, so the HOPE team is um, a city of Seattle, a team of C city of Seattle employees that do street based outreach um, for people living unsheltered and their offer to participate in this multi partner um, uh, collaboration is really exciting. It, it represents a, um, a new uh, role or function for that team and we really welcome them. They are more likely to be on the street in this zone than the um, KCRHA, the Regional Homelessness Authority systems advocates, so they can be that that linkage. Um, the Regional Homelessness Authority, of course, is doing an emphasis on people living unsheltered downtown and trying to get to functional zero um, in that regard. And um, so they are gonna be, they are working with or uh, going to be attempting to work with folks living unsheltered in downtown throughout the time that we're working on this project. Downtown Emergency Service Center, of course, works with people who are unsheltered, but with a special focus on people with um, mental illness, including high acuity mental illness. So their behavioral health response team um, provides ongoing case management to mentally ill folks who are not um, in crisis. The mobile crisis team is the crisis response. That's a team that works at DESC, but it's um, deployed by, the, by crisis connections. 
Um, the mid, your own, uh, your own mid obviously does wake ups and clean team responses um, to sort of environmental conditions in the zone. Um, who am I missing? Lead, and it is a um, metropolitan improvement district. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and and lead and, and reach provide ongoing long term sustained case management for people with substance use disorder um, who commit crimes related to substance use disorder or poverty. Yeah. And Captain Strand, you know, you've been with SPD for I think 30, more than 30 years. Is there something about this moment now, 2022, that makes this effort coalesce at this point? Why, a reason why it didn't happen five years ago or two years ago or a year ago? Why is this happening now from your perspective? Uh, I think from my perspective, the reason that this is gaining so much traction is just because of what we've experienced as a city over the last few years. Uh, I, I think things had gotten the worst they had ever been um, when you saw all the boarded up stores, um, employees that had been out due to the pandemic, you know, afraid to come back to work. And then the residents that lived in the area afraid to leave their homes. And so uh, there's just a lot going on that really made this a uh, something that needed to be fixed. And I think enough people realized that and wanted to to be part of that solution to um, get the plywood down, get the businesses open, get the area activated, um, get the unhoused into the shelters. Um, things that couldn't be done for the last two years that now can be um, in a real kind of drive and thirst to fix those problems. And is there risk in focusing on an area that's bounded by certain street names, um, east and west, north and south? Is there a risk in then driving the activity that's within that zone into other adjacent zones, or is that is that an unfounded thing to worry about? For for me, it's something definitely to worry about. Um, that you know, we when we look at our emphasis in a particular area, we want to look at displacement, and are we just pushing it from one neighborhood to another neighborhood? And then now we have to move our operation to that new place. So it really is about finding long-term solutions to get uh, the people committing the crimes and creating the, the havoc, you know, really getting them into better places. Um, so they're not on the streets victimizing the uh, retail shops and that other people can do go about their business and lives in their neighborhoods um, safely. Uh, and so, yeah, to me, it's it's really, while we may focus on the worst area, we want to expand that out. And I tell some of our nicer neighborhoods that this does mean that they have to drop their level of safety down and it all has to be uh, equal. You know, we can try to work on the worst problems first, but uh, we really want to improve things for everybody. And. You know, we talked at the start of the program about this anecdotal sense that things were improving, and then we looked at data that that seems to back that up. Though there have been, there was one question in the um, in the Q and A about whether the the data reflects people not reporting as much because they're you know they're frustrated and not reporting. I want to give you a chance to respond to that, Captain Strand. Yeah, I am concerned that uh, people are not reporting crime that they should be, uh, and so I'm always encouraging people that. Uh, you know, we are a very data-driven organization, and so we want to put our resources where we are needed the most. And so if a neighborhood is not reporting crimes, um, we really ask them to step up, and uh, we look at ways <clears throat> to increase that reporting. <clears throat> One of those is in our Chinatown International District, where language is an issue. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and so we have a lot of translation services so that we can get people to report the crimes that they're seeing so that we're not ignoring their needs. Got it. Um, and in terms of the, you know, again, that, that anecdotal, that, that perception, because I think so much of these efforts are about hearts and minds. And if people who work downtown or people who have businesses downtown or people coming to shop downtown for the holidays see changes or see things that make them uncomfortable, it has a direct impact on the feel of downtown and the future of downtown. Uh, I know this program hasn't actually officially started yet, but how will people know that it's successful? If they're, if they're, will it, will, will it be visible on the streets of Seattle? Will there be a way to point to this and say, okay, the third Avenue project is having success? Lisa. 
or, um, or who wants I, who wants to take that? I mean, I, if he, I, I want to hear Lisa answer that. <laughs> <laughs> if the answer is no, then it didn't work. The our the um, touchstone for all of our work is felt impact. It it needs to actually um, make the situation better and feel like it makes the situation better. That's the whole point. So um, you know that's a very reasonable expectation uh, and. I think we're very confident that that it will. Um, this degree of coordination and presence just has a calming and, um, you know, uh, uh, problem solving impact. And so, yeah, I, I'm highly confident, but, you know, you'll know <laughs> if you spend time on Third Avenue mm. and have any memory of what it was like a year ago, you'll know whether or not we're we're being successful. There will also be data, but data don't always, I mean, to the point that was made in the chat, um, reported data don't always um, capture, you know, what it's really like out there. And we all know what it's been like out there and we know what we're trying to improve. So um, if we didn't improve it, we didn't succeed. And, and we're going to, I think, be our own, uh, closest critics on that. So we will continually revisit the first three months of this. You know, we're going to be setting up systems, making sure that they're working we will continuously revise hours approach. You know, if um, there's something missing, one of the questions in the chat, if there's a service missing, will we try to add it? Um, we obviously can't like commandeer things, but we will um, ask for any existing service to, to join our effort um, if it's missing and needed. And if there's something that just needs to be created, one of the points of this is to raise that up and go to local authorities and say, this this is what's really missing and this is where investment is really needed. It's particularly important when the county is contemplating. Uh, Losing your audio a little bit, Lisa. Uh, sorry. Well, I can echo what uh, Lisa was saying. my video off. Okay. Hang on. Go ahead, Captain Strand, while Lisa turns her video off. Go ahead and. Um... Yep. So I just uh, I want to echo what uh, Lisa said to me. We can have, um, you know, a lot of different anecdotal um, positive stories to tell. Um, but really what I want to do, and, it, and as the police department, we can always uh, tell the community all the things we're doing as far as uh, emphasis and outreach. But the solution to me, or the way we know we've made progress is just, does it feel safer? You know, do you go places you avoided before? Do you, um, and this summer I saw a tremendous number of people with their iced coffees walking down sidewalks. I saw less people sleeping in doorways. Um, and to me, that, that was just a huge um, sign that we're on the right track. Okay. And I don't know if Lisa's back now or not. I can't, I know her video's off. Audio? Are you there, Lisa? Is your audio working? Yes, I I can hear you. Yeah, you still sound a little uh, pixel pixelated. The audio equivalent of pixelation. Um, I know there's part of this uh, part of the way that makes this distinguishes effort from previous projects is the um, is the um, we deliver care being involved. Um, Talk a little bit, a bit about your methodology, um, Dom, in terms of the people that you recruit to be part of your program and how, why that makes them more effective in, in what's going to be attempted here with this Third Avenue project. Well, for the last couple of years, when a couple of years ago, we got uh, started doing work with uh, co-lead and lead, um, providing uh, de-escalation teams in the hotels that they uh, have their participants staying at and just to keep that community safe. Uh, the demographic of people that we hire uh, have lived life experiences with um, um, the same people that they serve, right? They've been through the legal system, they've been through the streets, they've been through some of them experienced homelessness before all these things. Um, and then being able to uh, put them in a position to go through these trainings and, and empower them to go back into these communities and be effective and be a help and an aid those communities is just it changes the whole mindset of a person so now what we've been able to do is build these these uh, relationships in each 
hotel that we're at. So we have these staff that rotate through these hotels on shifts, but they, they are constantly talking and, and communicating with the participants and building relationships and connections with the staff and all these things. So when something does escalate, we are able to step in, right? through the relationships we built, through the training that we've had, and be able to de-escalate things um, very quickly just by knowing the people that are in the situation, by having the relationship with them and knowing I could like, you know, hey, Johnny, put the bat down. You must be out of cigarettes. It's Wednesday, and usually on Wednesday, you run out of cigarettes. Come on, I'm going to walk you to the store and get you a pack of cigarettes. You know you can't try to hit people with a bat. Put the bat down and let's go talk. And Johnny's like, yeah, I am out of cigarettes. Puts the bat down. Now they're walking and talking. They're going to get a pack of cigarettes because the relationship was built knowing the patterns um, of the participants. I mean, I'm just giving you a small example. We've dealt with weapons. We've dealt with drugs. We've dealt with all that stuff over the last couple of years. And we've been able to bring a nice, safe presence. And, and, and honestly, those hotels operate like a small village, like a, a very small community. And everybody is connected through that. And so... We want to take that same model and try to emulate that downtown, right? Do the same thing in, in um, correlation with everything that's already happening down there with law enforcement and everybody else, right? It's management and all that. Mm -hmm. And so the people that we have also, that we have been, that we hire also have a, um, a stern presence because their lived life experience puts them in a position where they carry themselves in a way and relate in a way where, you know, they're, they're not um, timid or scared to be in these environments. And, and, and that, that, that is, that's a lot because people can read you and people can, can you know, see, you know, whether you're afraid or whether, or whether you have a heart for the work, or whatever that looks like. So, you know, I mean, things like that. All right. And it looks like Lisa's back with us now. Um, I mean, it's, the project is, I mean, it's, it's admirable in its complexity and the, it has to be complex because there are so many different organizations involved, um, whether directly or indirectly in addressing this issue, because the issue is so complex, so deeply rooted, goes back so far into so many different directions. Um, and I imagine there's, there's fiscal barriers. I mean, if you had more money, you could probably, if you actually had money directed, dedicated money, you could do more than, than you're already planning to do. And, uh, uh, you know, commit to doing it for a longer period than just this initial one-year trial period, right? Um, are there political barriers? Are there elected officials or agencies or are there political, political realities that stand in the way of this program being as successful as it could be? Um, can you hear me? Yeah. So I'm going to go with no, there are not <laughs> political barriers. Um, I actually think that this is one thing that almost everybody in Seattle agrees about. So we saw, and again, you know, WDC was a partner on Just Care, and we saw together, and you know, with SPD as well, that um, you know, no one is against a um, care coordination response to really complex, um, impactful problems when we actually come, when um, after we came, things actually got better, and there's an obvious, visible, felt improvement. Nobody's against that. And so um, I don't actually think that there are political barriers. We actually do have, I mean, the truth is we have very profound financial barriers. The, um, it, I want to say, you know, the mayor's office committed funds in the midst of a really difficult um, budget picture uh, to launch the, um, the new team for We Deliver Care. And without that, we wouldn't be able to undertake this. So, um, but the rest of us who are doing the work within budget, um, many of us are actually seeing uh, in real terms our budgets uh, cut. And so um, it's getting more challenging even since we promised to do this. So there are real, um, there are real operational logistical barriers, but I think that that's within the context of a lot of goodwill. So we'll just have to figure it out. Um, you know, it's a rough time. It's a rough time for um, public officials trying to make prudent, wise, prioritized investments. And we know that. So, um, you know, showing up like this is the best gesture that we can make toward um, uh, 
we have to make, I guess I should say, we just have to make the very best use of the investments that are being made. And coordinating like this is taking, is leveling up the, you know, social service, public safety strategies in an important way at a time when everyone is very clear, we can't, um, we can't do things that aren't impactful and effective. So we're gonna try to be impactful and effective. It, but I just like, it, it's incredibly hard. The um, workforce challenges for social service providers right now are cannot be exaggerated, which is why when I say everyone's leaning in to do it anyway, um, this is really like a civic minded gesture by all of your um, service provider uh, colleagues out there um, because we know when we say that the answer to these conditions is not, you know, jail or displacement, I mean, that may be true for most people and there has to be an answer. <clears throat> and we know that, and we have to demonstrate that there can be one. So if this works well, I think it'll have some implications for where funding should go in, you know, in future years, because um, we, this really may be an improvement. Uh, compared to these siloed programs that that we've all stood up over the years uh, past. Yeah. And for those who listening or watching today who might be um, either skeptical or maybe be experiencing compassion fatigue or coalition fatigue or, you know, this sort of because we're, you know, we're obviously we're many years into the pandemic. We're many years into the longstanding issues that were in place before the pandemic. Um, how do you how do you convince those people, those those skeptics, that this is different this time? That this is this is worth maybe even person, maybe maybe individuals who want to support this effort can make contributions or or groups that want to throw their their weight behind this effort. How do you convince those people that this is this is different this time? This is this is going to work different than those other earlier attempts. Uh, well, so I don't. First of all, we are building on the approach of just care, which I don't think anyone thought was ineffective. It was highly effective. It was highly impactful. And I think it, it built a lot of credibility. Um, so I'm not, I don't think, like we learned from that, how credibility is built. And it's what I said, show up, do the work. There's other people on this call who work in similar veins. So um, we're not asking anybody to take a leap of faith. You should, um, you know, like it if you like it, and if it works, I'm confident that um, that that uh, constituency, you know, will will emerge. But you've got to solve people's problems. <laughs> so that's what we. This began in a conversation um, in a a restaurant that is trying to stay open on Third Avenue that experienced um, uh, individuals with. Um, severe mental illness, you know, so, I mean, probably didn't know what they were doing, but um, who uh, assaulted a, um, an employee and like threw a rock through a window, um, nearly hitting a, a, a patron that, you know, we need to reduce the incidence of those kinds of conditions and the type of thing that people are typing about in the chat. Um, if we do, you know, it's always a challenge for people to remember that it used to be worse because even when things get better, right, um, you're you're very aware of the problems that you have and not necessarily that they've gotten better. So all I would ask is that people hold on to their memory that it's been very problematic. And if we are able to make a discernible improvement that people, you know, sort of um, buy in rather than feeling disappointed that everything isn't, you know, I mean, we're not going to be able to eliminate drug use, um, extreme poverty, um, and mental illness in the city of Seattle, but we can create environmental conditions where that is managed and responded to much, much better. Um, and that's the goal. Yeah, and I think that the challenge has always been around um, Third Avenue or any any challenging civic issue is the communications aspect of it. Um, when the problems are visible, you know, you don't need anybody telling you that there's problems, but when the solutions are that the visible part goes away to what you said a moment ago, that not remembering how bad it was, that's where the challenge is for people like you and other, anyone involved in, and really all of us in telling those stories in a way that makes it clear that we are making progress. Cause that, you know, you, you have to fuel people's hope. Not, I'm not talking about propagandizing or, or spin, but uh, you know, data driven. And that's, you know, like the, the, 
the uh, dashboards that were, I'm sure they existed before the pandemic. I didn't really pay much attention to any dashboards until the pandemic where they had all the lists of all the different you know, things that were being monitored in terms of testing rates and vaccination and everything. That data, you know, the data can be, often the data can be spun different ways, obviously, but having data and telling the stories in a way that keeps people's hope and keeps fueling support for efforts like this, I think is really key. Um, I think that's encouraging about the, the, what you said about the political, there no being no political barriers. I think that's, that's, that's encouraging. Um, Captain Strand, you mentioned the city attorney's office and the high utilizer list. Is the city attorney's office, are they involved directly with this effort? Yeah, so they uh, they have a, a list of about 120 individuals throughout the city that are just the, the highest repeat offenders. Um, and they are, uh, a lot of times, uh, there's a number of them that are on Third Avenue that we deal with on a pretty regular basis. Um, and so that is uh, something that we can really focus our efforts on. So, um, you know, a lot of times they're the main players in some of these um, <clears throat> retail theft uh, organizations that uh, are doing this black market for the fueling the drug drug trade, <clears throat> as well as the uh, stolen <clears throat> excuse me stolen merchandise. Okay, um, one of the things, Lisa, you mentioned that prompted a question. You talked about the crisis in um, human uh, human resources crisis and social service staffing crises. and you know we hear about that in plenty of industries, um, given the what's happened with the pandemic. Is there a particular profound effect that it's having on the human service sector? Oh, looks like Lisa's your screen might be frozen. Um, so let's let's uh, let's pretend it's a. a what are you back? Anyway, so looking looking ahead, say a year or two down the road, um, if this program is successful, how quickly do we think can we see radical improvement? In the in this part of downtown Seattle, Captain Strand. Um, I think we can. Uh, I think with this new uh, initiative, with what we're doing uh, currently, and then adding on these new levels of outreach, uh, I think it could be very impactful and happen in a short amount of time. And when I say short amount of time, I would think within months uh, or weeks. You know, you will notice something changing in this area. And I don't know that we've said it before, but uh, we're looking at the area kind of between Union and uh, Stewart for this uh, outreach and service providers. But for the police department, we're looking at the entirety of Third Avenue going all the way from Belltown down to uh, the Fountain and the King County Courthouse there at Yesler uh, and, and trying to really dig in and make a, a bigger impact with, you know, the limited resources that we all have. Okay. And I don't know if, if Lisa's back, but I think we just have a few minutes left, but, um, and, and Lisa addressed this a little bit already, but if people want to get involved, they want to support this effort, either fiscally or politically or, or, or show their support for it, what's the best way to do that now? Is that something that you can answer, um, Dominique? No, that's not my lane. <laughs> I'll let Lisa answer that question. Okay. I think she's back. Okay. I'm, I've been here the whole, I'm just turning off my video in hopes that it would improve the audio because yeah. that's all we can do. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, there's okay. just a few minutes left. I wanted to just figure to, out. Yeah, to help. Um, yeah. So in the chat, I put um, the, the project manager for the Third Avenue project is Sean Blackwell. Sean is S E A N dot blackwell b l a c k w e l l at defender.org and again i type that in the chat um sean can collect um ideas for contributions specifically if folks want to contribute money we want to create some um employment fellowships that would travel with individuals who want to work in a sector that kind of animates their you know dreams for their own future and uh being able to bring you know a year of of funding with them alleviates employers reticence about hiring people that don't necessarily have a conventional work history so that that is a wonderful way to contribute um donations in kind probably also could be you know if people want to do a meal for the workers that's incredibly morale building um can't say enough about how great that was during the pandemic when we were doing just care and restaurants would donate a meal 
So there's lots of ways, sean.blackwell at defender.org, Sean is S-E-A-N, um, and we can work with whatever uh, you think, uh, you know, have in mind. Thanks for that. Okay, terrific. And um, it's just near the end here, I want to give each of you guys um, kind of a final thought, something, some, leave us with something hopeful, something positive, to, uh, and this has been a pretty positive conversation, um, but start with you, uh, Captain Strand, what's something positive we can look forward to something to be hopeful about given uh, everything before us all the challenges and long-standing issues yeah no I, um, I I do think there's uh, definitely many reasons to be positive um, for us our summertime is sometimes a busy time for us to really get through uh, all of the demands on our resources that uh, the parades and the fourth of July's and all the different activities that happen throughout the city and the increase in uh, our cruise ships that come to town in the tourist industry. Um, and so I think we've made it through that uh, time and now we have, uh, we can focus our resources more on these uh, kind of uh, elements of disorder and criminal conduct uh, that we didn't have the time to throughout those summer months and really drill down and figure out what the solutions are and work with our partners to to get us into a better place. All right. Dominique Davis. Um, I really feel hopeful um, and I'm excited about the project um, because the, the people that I really want to address, there was a question in the chat that, um, you know, people are down there dealing drugs. We know that, and there's, you know, the whole fentanyl epidemic and all that. And um, I feel like that, is something that I'm looking forward to addressing with this team and with this collaboration and getting people the help that they need, um, maybe even providing some kind of other um, source of income that is more uh, <laughs> palatable for the community and also um, more um, uplifting and more, um, not demoralizing, but moralizing, right? Um, so I'm, I'm just looking forward to providing other options for people um, to get them in a better space in life, not just cleaning up the area, but cleaning up people's lives. So I want to go after actually helping people, right? And when you help people, then you help the community and the community can thrive. So that's All right. I'm All right. Thank you. And Lisa, I'm going to count your last answer as your positive thought for the day, because we're running out of time. Um, but I totally want to thank fine. our pa panelists, Lisa Dugard, do Dominique Davis, and Captain Steve Strand. I want to thank everyone for joining us today for DSA Virtual Access, all the DSA staff, Please plan on joining us on Thursday, December 15th for our next DSA virtual access event. Keep an eye on your inbox for more information and get more about the series at downtownseattle.org. Don't forget the annual DSA tree lighting is Friday, November 25th. That's one week from tomorrow already. Until then, I'm Felix Bunnell on behalf of DSA. Thanks for joining us this morning. Happy Thanksgiving, and we'll see you downtown.